Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 36th episode of the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. My name is Kevin Ballister. I am a severe traumatic brain injury survivor, creator of adventuresinbraininjury.com, creator of feedabrain.com, uh, host of the Feed a Brain interview series, and author of How to Feed a Brain, Nutrition for Optimal Brain Function and Repair, which is now available on Amazon. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Revive Treatment Centers of America, a multidisciplinary neurorehabilitation center located in Denver, Colorado. They specialize in neurodegeneration, brain injury, concussions, autoimmunity, specifically neuroautoimmunity, as well as thyroid conditions and other aspects of health, chronic conditions. With me, as always, is my co-host, Michelle Maumberg up in Canada. What's up, Michelle? <laughs> What's up? About one foot of snow at three degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. And oh, it's beautiful up here. It's absolutely beautiful. It looks like um, just, it's a winter wonderland. Yeah. It's That's gorgeous. Awesome. It is. It is. It's a nice, nice day to stay huddled inside and record a podcast. <laughs> well, perfect. <laughs> perfect. And, and so we, we have. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Who do we have with Yeah, us? we have a phenomenal a typical medical doctor on our show today, Dr. John Lemansky. Uh, his uh, tagline is the keto doctor. We're going to talk about ketogenic diets. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest. Dr. Lemansky is a board certified physician of internal medicine. And as a hospital a hospitalist and clinician for over five years, he sees an average of 30 patients a day. He's seen a lot, and what strikes him is that the majority of the diseases he gets to assess on a daily basis are a direct result of the American diet. Kevin, you and I often refer to the SAD diet, the standard American diet, which is indeed pretty sad, and Dr. Lemansky is going to highlight why. He says the vast majority of these diseases are, in fact, preventable, and many are reversible, which is really exciting hopeful and great news, period. Um, I really like what his words, you know, I, I'm a lover of words, and his website, his first uh, quote on the website is, when you finally realize that food is thy medicine, your path towards lasting health becomes very clear. So it sounds awfully darn simple if we just take a look at what's on our plate, in our hand, and in our mouth. So Dr. Lemansky, welcome to the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk a little bit more about, you know, the influence of nutrition, especially on brain health. Yes, Perfect. and we are, yes, we're so excited to, to welcome you. Kevin, Kevin, yeah, yeah you yeah, had... So Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just like what you had uh, had said about Dr. Lemansky. He's always had a love for the practice of medicine, and we wanted to to better understand what kind of medicine he did practice and what kind of medicine he now practices. Yeah, so you know, my story is very similar to a lot of people, I think, in terms of coming around to the importance of the ketogenic diet. So for myself, I've been practicing this way for about 13 years or so. And it's been kind of a accumulation of information that's led me to believe that this is really the healthiest way to eat. After medical residency, I went to the South and worked in Mississippi for about five years as a hospitalist and working in the hospital, seeing patients that were basically afflicted with all these metabolic diseases that are starting to show up in you know, news outlets. So diabetes, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, and then not only that, but the consequences of, of all those things leading to cardiovascular disease, strokes, dementia, Alzheimer's, that we now refer to essentially as diabetes type 3 or diabetes of the brain. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, 
I think as a medical society, we've looked at all these diseases as separate entities that, okay, well, you have diabetes, mm -hmm. you have high blood pressure without really addressing, is there a correlation between all of these diseases? And the answer to that is, yes, there is. And that correlation wow. is insulin. Uh -huh. I really appreciate how you're starting off with metabolic diseases. And, you know, many, many people don't understand what metabolic diseases are. So can you expand on, on that? Yeah, sure. So like I was saying, so there's a few things that really kind of meet up or make up the criteria for metabolic syndrome. And so in order to really kind of meet the, the criteria, you have to have three of these fo following five criteria, and that is obesity, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, and high LDL and low HDL. And that's to meet the criteria of the current Meta definition. Right, of metabolic syndrome. Right. Which is important because the underlying cause of all those different factors is high insulin levels in the body. Mm. And so instead of individually treating each type of disease as kind of a Band-Aid approach, so right now... The way that we treat these diseases, if you have high blood pressure, then we give you medications to bring your blood pressure down. If you have diabetes, we give you medications to either increase insulin sensitivity in the body or medications to drop your glucose level. Instead of saying, well, what's the root cause of all these things? It's actually high insulin production. So how do we get insulin production to go down? So <laughs> let's talk about insulin. What, what is insulin? When is it produced and what does it do? Okay. So insulin has thousands of functions. It has so many functions, but in, in terms of uh, regulating obesity and regulating metabolic syndrome, the most important factors that insulin really drives are control of glucose in the blood system. So right now, let's say you go out and you drink a soda, which is pure glucose, or right now it's actually pure high fructose corn syrup. So, right, right. But let's say for this discussion that we just drink pure glucose, okay? So what happens in the body is glucose skyrockets in your bloodstream. The okay. body doesn't like that, and it wants a very tight range of glucose. So insulin production goes up, and it drives the glucose into the cells, and it does that through mediation of a couple ways, but mostly by GLUT4 receptors. And those receptors basically drive the glucose into the cells or into the liver. Now your glucose comes back down to normal and, and you're, you, know, you feel better, your body is happier. Unfortunately, what's, been, what's happening is that that excess glucose that's happening in the blood basically gets converted into lipoproteins or LDL triglycerides and eventually gets stored as fat. The combination of that with fructose and high fructose corn syrup is that those also go to the liver and get converted into triglycerides. And so you have this double whammy where based on the way that we're eating, you have excessive glucose, which is driving insulin production, and then you have excessive fructose and high fructose corn syrup, which is driving a lot of these metabolic diseases, development of triglycerides, the development of hypertension, and, and such. And so, so are you telling me that when I eat sugar, I create fat in my blood? And it's yes. not fat that that puts the, the fat, the triglycerides in my blood, but sugar does that more? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the fundamental misunderstanding that we have in the nutritional world. It's it's not necessarily the fat, it's the sugar and more specifically fructose, high fructose corn syrup that doctors like Dr. Lustig has really kind of highlighted that uh, to the society. And even some authors like, sorry, it's, I forgot what his name is. Doctor, or, oh, authors, yeah. Gary, Gary Tobbs. Yeah, like Gary that. Tobbs. Oh my right, gosh, yeah. Has, has really illustrated that uh, sugar has basically been the driving force of a lot of these metabolic mm -hmm. diseases. The unfortunate part though, and I think what a lot of people really don't realize is that it's not as simple as saying, okay, well, sugar is the cause of all this, so I'll start, stop eating sugar. It's in everything now. So yes, yes. it has been placed in specifically high fructose corn syrup because cost and because now as a society, we've almost been kind of adapted to a higher sugar content, a sweeter taste. Right, yes. And so people now, if you, you know, 
take the example of a, of a rotisserie chicken. If you go out to the store and you get a rotisserie chicken, it's inevitably going to be very sweet. And why is that? Well, that's, that's what people are used to now as a taste. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's in... Find. It's in every condiment, you know, yes. ketchup has it. So anyway, yes. so now it's ubiquitous in our society. Even things like bread, which you wouldn't think would have. <laughs> Sugar is added to bread because it's a way to absorb water and keep it moist. Right, right, yes. Right, and so, you know, if you bake regular bread on your own without all the additives, it goes bad within 24 hours. Well, why <laughs> is that? Because there is no sugar to hold the water in. And so it becomes stale and, and nasty. And same with the peanut butter. It, uh, it so, so perfectly uh, homogenizes the oil so nobody has to stir exactly. the jar of peanut butter. The separation doesn't occur with all that sugar, but the separation of health does. And I think what we're getting into there is trans fats and different kinds of fats. So, mm-hmm. so what you we met at KetoCon. I was presenting right. at KetoCon, you were presenting at KetoCon and we were on a panel together as well. And you are the keto doc. So, keto is a high fat, low carb kind of protocol. And I wanted to talk about the kinds of fats that most Americans eat that are part of the standard American diet. And then what, yeah, let, let's start with that. Sure. What are the most common? Yeah. And I would almost make the argument. And are that, they healthy? Uh, so no, they're not healthy. <laughs> but I would almost make the argument that the amount of damage that it's being done by consumption of hydrogenated oils is, is almost worse than the amount of damage done by sugar consumption. Wow. I would wow. agree with that. Absolutely. And, and the reason I say that, so it all goes back historically to this idea that saturated fats were bad for you. And so when you look at fats, there's different types of fats. So saturated fats that you find in things like butter, lard, you know, coconut oil, basically their structure is without any double bonds. Those double bonds that are in the other types of fat are much more likely to get oxidized and cause what we call ROS or free radicals. And those free radicals do a tremendous amount of damage to your body. So when we as a society said, well, saturated fats are bad because they're linked to cardiovascular disease, which they are not, and they've been proven not to be, we as a society had to figure out, okay, what other fats can we use? And so a lot of companies started coming out with products that they they wanted to use. And the irony is that when we used to use lard as mostly the types of fat in these products, they have a very stable shelf life, right? So they, they don't have double bonds, so they don't go rancid. And because of that, they stay pretty long, right? Mm -hmm. So how long do you keep your coconut oil in the jar? You can keep it a long time. (laughs) Yes. So once we started saying that saturated fats were bad, we actually had to come up with a different type of product. Mm -hmm. And at the time that product was vegetable oil. Which so, doesn't contain any vegetables. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, Interestingly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good marketing tool, right? Yes, say, well, look, it? this is vegetable oil. But yeah. things like canola oil, which is now, I think, ubiquitously the most prevalent type of oil out there, yes, um, yes. started being used. And it's still being used in a lot of products. Mm-hmm. Problem with those is that they are actually unstable. And so a lot of the food companies had to come out and say, okay, well, let's figure out how to make this more stable. And that's when they came up with trans fats. Mm. Mm. But so trans fats awesome. really became known to be very dangerous. And so, it, but it took 20 to 30 years of really people pushing and saying, we need to get rid of these trans fats to get them out of our, our food system. Mm. And they're still not out of our food no. system. In fact, yeah, they, yeah. They're not. like now they're labeled. And, and that's, that's great, you know, but that's, that's it. And so what you're saying is with the, with the double bonds and sorry to get into chemistry here. Um, but when we're, when we're looking at the, the, a saturated fat is essentially single bonds all the way down the line. A unsaturated fat is, has some double bonds and the double bonds are weaker is that what you would say they're less stable yeah they're more likely to get oxidized so 
it, when you and look what at, does that mean if they're oxidized? Yeah. So when you look at basic cellular function, which is <clears throat> in something called a mitochondria, and mitochondria is basically the energy battery of the cell. Mm -hmm. So each cell in our body has thousands of these, except for your red blood cells and a few other cells don't have them. But at that level, that's where all these processes that we're talking about essentially happen. And so when you have fats that are, you know, unsaturated, what are called monounsaturated or polyunsaturated, they have more double bonds that are available to basically be oxidized by hydroxyl groups. And so without getting too technical, every process in your cell produces some byproduct. And that byproduct tends to be a group called OH. And that's a hydroxyl group. That thing is very unstable and it wants to attach to something. And so the first thing that it finds that it can attach to is one of these double bonds. And in that process, it basically makes that rancid, essentially. So it gets <laughs> oxidized. Eventually, this, the body recognizes that that mitochondria, that cell is unhealthy and it wants to destroy it. You also get damage to DNA from these free radicals. And so eventually you get damage to the DNA, which leads to the cell either malfunctioning or the body trying to destroy it. So it sounds like we have these, these reactive oxygen species within our, within our body, which then, which, which are OH groups that essentially, if they run into a double bond, they oxidize, they attach to that. And in doing so, it damages whatever that, you know, um, molecular setup was, and it changes it so that it's no longer functional. Right. And you have to understand that this is a natural process. Our body uses these reactive oxygen species in a natural process to defend ourselves. So it's not something that because of our diet is, is all of a sudden a new phenomenon. These are all normal and it's part of a natural way of eating or a way of your body to defend itself from bacteria, from viruses. What's happened though is that it's, the system is overwhelmed. Yes, yes. Continuously <laughs> being exposed to things that the body views as foreign and is continuously damaging to the DNA and to the cell membrane. So the problem with like the trans fats or, or a lot of these newer fats that we're discovering is that they get incorporated into the cell membrane. And once it gets incorporated into the cell membrane, which is normally very fluid, it becomes very stiff. And once it becomes very stiff, the body sees that and says, well, this is not normal. I need to get rid of it. And when that happens, you get something called autophagy, which is the cell gets destroyed. Now, when the cell gets destroyed, it basically pukes its guts. So all, the, <laughs> all those reactive species that are in the cell now get thrown out into your system. Okay. And so you get this cascade of damage that happens to the body and this continuous process. And so that's why the type of fat that you consume is, or that's one reason why it's so important. Mm -hmm. And so we have been taught um, that these saturated fats are to be demonized and everybody's trimming their steak and mm -hmm. uh, getting the, um, I, I don't even know what it's called anymore. Low fat, but yogurt, lean, no lean, fat, yeah, lean fat. Well, I was, yeah. lean, lean, um, lean ground beef. You know, it's so mm -hmm. funny because when I, I talk to my butcher and I say, add the extra fat, everybody else is ordering. Because we, we, I'm so fortunate. I love being able to order my meat from our ranchers directly. And so I can say when it's at the abattoir, when they're butchering, please throw in everybody else's scraps because mm -hmm. they all this grass fed meat where actually there's a lot of nutrition in the fat. Mm -hmm. People want it trimmed. So I say, throw it into mine, throw it into <laughs> mine. I want the extra, extra fatty ground beef. And the extra, extra fat. And in fact, if there's any fat left over, I'll take the hunks of fat. And, and <laughs> I, I simply render it because I am, um, yeah, I just, I use respectfully, I use all of the animal. If I'm mm -hmm. going to have it uh, nourish me, I want it uh, to mm -hmm. be a respectful contribution to my life. But uh, we've been taught uh, to, to avoid these saturated fats when really we evolved on them, didn't we, Dr. Lemansky? Yeah, I mean, ancestrally, you know, that's that's essentially what people ate. And I think Gary Tobbs just has a book that came out and he looks into 
historically how introduction of, of sugar into societies that previously didn't, didn't have it led to you know exponential increase in all these metabolic diseases. Yes. But if you look back at what they were eating prior to the sugar being brought into their society, places in like the South Pacific, they basically feasted on fish. They feasted on coconuts, right. coconut oil derived from it, mostly saturated fat components, uh, and that made up the majority of their diet. So historically, though, Ansel Keys came out and said, look, saturated mm -hmm. fats is really what's causing cardiovascular disease. And it was all based on faulty scientific data. Unfortunately, paid for, more, paid for by well, taxpayers. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, you know, the problem with nutrition as it, as it relates to research is that there's no money to be made necessarily in dietary interventions. Yes. And so, and the amount of money that you would have to spend to really do a randomized controlled trial to show that saturated fat does not lead to heart disease is astronomical. Mm -hmm. But having said that, we have some of those studies. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and those studies have shown that saturated fat does not lead to heart disease, does not lead to decreased longevity, and quite the opposite, that people who had, you know, less saturated fats in their diet actually had higher levels of dementia higher levels of cancer, and they did not have higher levels of cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, though, that information is, is just not disseminated throughout the medical community, and we're still going based on the same premise that saturated fat is bad. I really appreciate that you brought up the economic influence yes, in this, yes. um, because when we're talking about, you know, um, there's there's no money in nutrition. There's there's way less money in health. Period. You know, when if we're looking at a supply and demand model, where demand is what ups the uh, it requires supply of say drugs, surgery, whatever it is, when it comes to medicine, sick people are in demand way more than healthy <laughs> people are, aren't they? So I think that's, that's really interesting that that's kind of, a, kind of where we are with things. And, you know, thinking about you as, as a physician back years ago, you were also participating in triathlons and training very heavily and you hit your peak and you were doing really, really awesome. And then you had a plateau and then your decline. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to think back, back way back when. Yeah. So part of kind of my evolution into realizing the power of nutrition was that when I was in uh, medical school, I was doing a lot of uh, training for triathlons, for running, and I would work out you know, six days a week, and I wasn't doing it for weight loss. I was doing it because I was training. I actually had to get lab work done as part of medical school, and when I got my lab work back, I had a lot of markers that looked like I was on my way to being pre-diabetic. My ESR and CRP, which are you know, markers of inflammation were through the roof. My insulin level was up and all that didn't really make sense. How could this be where I'm eating, you know, what I thought was a very healthy diet. I was exercising. What you thought and what you were taught. And what, right. yeah, exactly yes. what I was taught. And, right. and how could this actually be? And I was, you know, in my early or late twenties, early thirties. So it just didn't make sense. And, and that's really what got me into kind of this evolution of figuring out well, why is this happening? And so at the you, time, there was wasn't studying, that much information out there. Right. So you, as an MD, you were taught that you were doing the healthiest thing. You were essentially being the healthiest person based on like what you knew as an MD. And then you get your lab work back and you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't <laughs> make much sense. Exactly. I'm doing everything right according to the books. So what did that drive you to start doing? Well, so it, it brought up two really critical ideas in my head. And the first one was that I was, you know, let's, I don't know exactly, but I would say probably nine to 10% body fat. So if you looked at me outwardly, you would say, okay, he's, he's in good shape. He must be healthy, right? Yes. And that's our perceptions in a society is that 
and we're un- inundated with it all day long. But if you have a six pack, if you're skinny, you know, right. that is the model of health. Whereas if you're obese, then that's the model of sickness. And so how, how do you correlate that with, I am skinny, I'm healthy, or, but I'm unhealthy metabolically. Right, right. And, right. So, and that was kind of the turning point for me to say, okay, there must be something wrong. The second thing that really happened was as I started researching and um, came across a few you know, studies that looked really into uh, the ketogenic diet and, and how to eat in a more healthy uh, format, and I started doing it, I started feeling better. Mm, and and that to me was one of the most rewarding kind of side effects. I wasn't look. I thought I felt great, but I didn't really realize how <laughs> poorly I felt until I started eating a certain way, and all of a sudden started feeling much more energy, better sleep, you know, less. I used to get this uh, kind of what I'm assuming is a hypoglycemic effect, where right. after I would eat lunch, I would almost feel like I was going to pass out. Aha, uh-huh, yes. I, I hear that so much. Or people get hungry again. People right. get hungry just a couple hours later. Geez, I'm hungry again. I better go and eat another muffin. Or exactly. I'll just get a little snack bar. Or I'll grab some fruit. And so what mm-hmm. happens when people are grabbing the muffin and coffee, the snack mm-hmm. bar, the fruit? Because an apple's healthy, isn't it? Well, <laughs> so my answer always, you know, usually is it depends. So an apple can be healthy uh, or it can be unhealthy. And Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is it depends on metabolically what your body is doing. So the common vicious cycle that a lot of people encounter is I wake up in the morning, my blood sugar is low, my brain is starving for energy because at this point, you remember the body can either use glucose or ketones as energy. Right. in order to really use the ketones, which are derived from either exogenous ketones, MCT oil, or from your own fat stores, your body has to be adapted. It has to be able to actually use those energies. But for most people, the energy that they can use is glucose. And so the brain is going to preferentially take all the glucose it can, because if it doesn't have it, then you don't stay alive. So the brain gets a shot of glucose from breakfast, which inevitably is going to be predominantly you know, sugar. And then <laughs> once it hits that, your body responds with insulin to drive that sugar down. Now, unfortunately, your brain doesn't have energy anymore. And so mm-hmm. it's sending out signals that, mm-hmm. look, I'm, I'm starving. You need to eat something. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And at right. the same time, the glucose, because the brain doesn't have that glucose as energy, you get that brain fog. You get that feeling mm-hmm. like you're going to pass out. You mm-hmm. don't feel good. You get headaches. You almost feel, some people can feel nauseous. And so what happens, that's a very powerful signal to your body saying, okay, I need to eat more. And because people have the impression that fat is bad, well, and all the food products that are available are predominantly sugar, mm-hmm. that's what they're going to go for. Or they're going to go for caffeine, which is te- a temporary fix. Right, right. I, I do remember a case um, where a, a father was feeding a son, the son would get low blood sugar, and he would give him a donut. Now, why they had mm-hmm. donuts on hand. And then another case where a woman, she said she could not drive across town without having to stop to get snack. I mean, and in... in town for me in a city of of a million, now a million and a half, is, um, you know, she couldn't go 15, 20 minutes. Mm. She was crashing every 15 to 20 minutes. She'd have to stop. And and of course, she's grabbing fast food. So at a convenience store uh, or a gas station, um, she'd be grabbing something to eat. But I I mean, that's extreme volatility for Mm. for the body, but also the brain. So mm. that's a very what, important point. What uh, Norga Gattis talks about with being a metabolic slave. And I can, I can relate to that. You know, I used to need snacks with me all the time, you know. And I, I've had roommates that are like carrying around snacks. Got to have snacks with us all day, <laughs> right? And I used to be that way. I used to need to have snacks on hand. Because what if I get hungry? Like, what am I going to do? And that's just not the case anymore. So how did you, you know, you're, you're a doctor and you're seeing this isn't working. And then you said you learned about, um, you started looking into keto. What, what steered you in that direction? 
You know, I think like most people, it's kind of an evolution. So before my diet was predominantly uh, vegetables, but I did do a lot of you know, healthy grains, because that was the dogma, healthy grains. So, um, you know, I would not eat a lot of fat because, you know, the impression was that fat is bad for you. And I would do like moderate protein. Um, I wasn't a big fast food eater, so I didn't have that problem. And I think that's probably why I wasn't, you know, obese. But the fact that predominantly my body was still deriving most of the energy from those simple sugars even if they're healthy grains, they still become simple sugars in your, in your bloodstream. Um, I was still in the same kind of cycle that we described earlier where I would need, you know, I would eat something like that. Uh, my body would process the glucose that was in it and I would, you know, get that hypoglycemic effect. And so I would have to eat a snack or, you know, another snack just to try to keep my uh, levels balanced. Um, you have those like gels. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> with your pure glucose. Just, oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Talk to any like runner, uh, triathlete, anybody who does endurance sports. I mean, they'll tell you what their favorite concoction is. And I had, I tried them all and I thought they were amazing. And I thought, you know, um, I would fuel myself with these things. And the irony is that a lot of those products become kind of your staple throughout the day. Right. So, yes. You know, and the habit. Yeah, and if you're like an elite athlete, you know what? You could probably consume those things and not have the metabolic effects because your body is churning out so much energy. Mm -hmm. However, if you're keto adapted, you know, it's been shown by Finney and Volek that you actually get much more endurance, you get better performance after you've kind of gone through that threshold and converted yourself to be fat adapted. Mm -hmm. But so I would consume all those things, not knowing that there's an alternative. Now, when I, I, you know, I still do quite a bit of exercise, I'm keto adapted. I don't eat anything. I mean, I drink water. I take electrolytes to make sure I don't get, you know, low blood pressure, but I'll go for two, two, three hours and not feel hungry at all, not lose performance. And that's all based on the fact that I'm keto adapted using my fat stores. Well, and it's interesting, Dr. Lemansky, um, those professional athletes, and we all think people used to tell me the same thing, oh, because I'm tall and slender. Oh, you can eat anything, can't you? You're, as a ballroom dancer, I, I'm retired. You know, you, you can eat anything, and that's not true. It's just not true. I didn't put on the weight, but um, I look at all of the professional athletes who mm -hmm. eat well and advertise what they eat when they're sitting on the sidelines. Dr. Catherine Shanahan wrote a book called Deep mm -hmm. Nutrition, and she yes. actually did a study Amazing on book. professional athletes. And just like you, their lab work was mm -hmm. appalling. And it was, as you say, the domino effect was in motion. They were en route to having develop or to to developing serious disease but they looked great they were fast they were wealthy i mean nobody was going to argue with their lifestyle exactly. however however so well, yeah let me just uh, say one thing about that i think that again goes to kind of this idea from society that if you're tall skinny athletic then you're healthy and the irony is that you know a lot of those athletes after they finish with you know, their career, which is very short, then you start seeing levels of diabetes go up, metabolic syndrome go up, because the only reason that they stayed skinny is because they were burning enough of those calories through the amount of exercise that they were doing to not hourly show this obesity. But the numbers were still metabolically dangerous. And the habits, uh, the habits they yeah, were forming the habits. as well. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think it's an important segue because a correlating to that is children. Uh -huh. So one of the things that I'm really trying to promote is we need to address this now when children are, you know, born to when they're growing because a very common example that I get from a lot of parents is that, well, you know, they're young, they can burn it off, they can eat whatever they want, you mm -hmm. know, you're depriving yeah. them. And, mm -hmm. and what, what we're seeing and what I was really shocked about uh, working in the South was that diseases that we used to see in people in their 60s and 70s, so cardiovascular disease, dementia, strokes, you know, diabetes, and all the consequences, we are now seeing it in patients in their 30s, late 20s. 
And so what has changed, the only thing that's really changed is the nutritional and the environmental exposures. But my concern is what's going to happen with the next generation? Yes, exactly. Being fed this food from utero. So a lot of studies have showed that the effects on the baby in utero when the woman is pregnant yes. not only affect that child, but actually the next generation. That's right. Through, through activation and deactivation of uh, genes. Well, and it's interesting. I just I found it fascinating that when a woman is pregnant with a female fetus, mm -hmm. that fetus already has her grandchildren. Right. So there are three generations in one body. Mm -hmm. So she's feeding, we, we always joke, oh, you're eating for two, but you're actually, <laughs> the woman is mm. eating for three generations, her own, mm. her unborn child, and then her unborn grandchildren, eggs mm. within that fetus. And so when we start to take a look at the the reality of of the situation you're right i'm as concerned as you are because um uh, well my primary interest was in pediatric nutrition and seeing parents wooed by the the marketing of these mm -hmm. flashy colorful tasty um bits of things uh and and just looking at the labels it's i mean the color isn't even real the ingredients aren't even food and their children are just chowing down on these little snack packets there are special cups made to hold these <laughs> snack packets so they don't spill i mean how far is it going to go and and um uh, the tantrums i mean it's just if you've ever spent an afternoon in a preschool mm -hmm. you can't imagine that the teachers are not paid enough to handle metabolically unstable toddlers mm. good heavens and i think that's so interesting the the metabolic you fix the nutrition and metabolism and you start supplying the brain with what it needs and not bombarding it with reactive oxygen species and whatnot. So again, reactive oxygen species being toxins and ATP being energy. If we can bring in less toxins, more nutrients, more, more substrate, more fuel for, for creating energy, that's awesome, and that's that's where high fat um, metabolism comes into play in a really powerful way. Um, we were talking about about how you, you said something about how different diseases uh, you see these diseases that you usually would see only in adults suddenly in children as well, and I just thought, well, yeah, like adult onset diabetes. <laughs> it's no longer called adult onset diabetes, right? Now it's just type 2 diabetes. That's right. Yeah, now, I mean, now it's even called you know, insulin dependent or non-insulin dependent. Mm -hmm. you know, it used to be that the majority of people who actually required insulin were just type 1 diabetics or insulin dependent diabetics. And that is you know, a genetic idea where you know you don't actually have insulin production after destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas that produce the insulin well the majority of people now who are insulin dependent diabetics are actually from insulin resistance and so as the sugar goes up in your bloodstream you know insulin responds to that the cells become insulin resistant. They don't listen to the insulin because it's a defense mechanism. They're, they're constantly being bombarded with it. And so they say, okay, there's something wrong here. Let's stop reacting to it. And so what happens? Somebody keeps on tapping you on the shoulder and you just exactly. insistently and you keep on turning on and going, what? <laughs> and then they, they got nothing. Like, yeah, after a while, it's like, after a while, you stop listen. listening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, Dr. Lemansky, I'm familiar with using a ketogenic diet in children to yes. help help uh, reduce seizures. So, epilepsy in children has shown um, great response to a ketogenic diet. Is ketogenic diet safe for adults, for children, for for all of us? I mean, there's so much confusion out there. So I will say yes, with the caveat that it depends on what you're actually consuming. So here's one of my biggest pet peeves. And I think this is why, from my perspective as a physician, I'm trying to make people understand that 
a ketogenic way of eating is a medical tool. So like you mentioned, it was started off as a way to treat epilepsy, a way to kind of control different metabolic diseases. It's kind of morphed into a, a focus on weight loss. And so weight loss, universally, people will come up to me and say, I want to lose 30 pounds in 20 days. Can I do a ketogenic you know, diet to do that? And my answer is, yeah, you probably can, but that's not the goal of a ketogenic lifestyle. And that's mm -hmm. why we call it a lifestyle instead of a diet, because this is a fundamental change of the way that you are uh, interacting with food, but also consuming food. And what do I mean by that? So a lot of people I'll, I'll see online will post a picture of like, you know, fast food uh, hamburger that they took the bun off and right, right. using that as a ketogenic diet. Well. Yeah, okay, it's probably predominantly fat, but it's also the wrong types of fat. It's consuming fats that are high in omega-6s, cheese that basically is not cheese but a cheese product. <laughs> and so, you're, you're, yeah, you might lose some weight, but the end goal of, the, of a ketogenic lifestyle is to improve your mitochondria. Right, right. Okay? If you improve your mitochondria, then your body becomes more efficient and the weight loss comes off. So if you're doing a ketogenic lifestyle in the right way, meaning that you're really consuming the right types of fats, which we can discuss, you're minimizing the amount of protein that you consume because excessive protein is actually quite dangerous for you. Yes. By activation of certain pathways like mTOR, which we can talk about, but I think that's a, a big subject. Um, <laughs> So by consuming the right types of fat, you know, modifying the amount of protein and consuming carbohydrates are okay as long as they're the right type of carbohydrates. So on the flip side, I see people who will not eat any carbohydrates. And I think that that is actually quite dangerous as well because you get a lot of benefit from the fiber in, in those carbohydrates. So when I talk about carbohydrates, I mean, you know, vegetables, green leafy vegetables, broccoli, asparagus, you know, things like cauliflower, things that are not very high sugar uh, containing uh, vegetables. Right, right. So if you do it in a certain way and you do it in the right way, then yes, ketogenic lifestyle is extremely beneficial. Um, it's not dangerous. But if you do it in a way where you're focused on, I just want to lose weight and I want to do it in the easiest way possible where I'm just going to consume fast food but take away the bun, then you'll probably lose weight, but you're not going to be healthy and you're not going to really get the benefits of being keto adapted or fat adapted. I really appreciate how you said, you know, lose weight or be healthy, you know, yes. the difference between those. And like, and you know, if you, if you, if you get healthy, you're going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. If you lose weight, you're not necessarily going to be healthy in doing exactly. so. Or keep it off. Well, yeah, you can, okay, you can go out and, and, you know, do a calorie restricted diet and, you know, drink three shakes a day of some concoction. Yeah, you're going to lose weight, but you know what's going to happen is you're going to actually do more damage. And this is what happens to a lot of people that are in this vicious cycle where they gain weight. So that's the focus. So I want to lose weight. How do I do that? Well, let me do this fad diet where I basically, you know, drink whatever, some concoction, and I lose 15 pounds. And then as soon as I finish that, I feel virtuous. You know, I just lost 15 <laughs> pounds. I go back to the way I was eating because I deserve this. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. what has happened? Well, your metabolism has actually dropped by 30%. You've right. lost mostly muscle mass and water, yeah. not actual fat. And so then you gain it all back and more because you're metabolically still unhealthy. And so if we can change the narrative where we're not focused on weight, which I get it, I understand. I mean, I've, I understand why it's such a focus. Mm -hmm. But if we change the narrative and focus on, you know, getting healthy at a cellular level, then the weight comes off. And so uh, let me just uh, go back. It, it almost seems like a teaser. Um, the types of fats, we've mentioned it throughout mm -hmm. the interview now. So before we, before we wrap up, let's reveal to the audience what, uh, what are those healthy types of fats you're referring to? Yeah, so I think it's important to get kind of a variety of fats. So obviously saturated fats are extremely important. So you can get those from 
butter, but it has to be grass fed butter yes. because, you know, if you just go out and you get your generic butter, the cows are being fed grains and those grains are mostly omega-6 predominant. So, and not just to like, mention genetically modified and right. sprayed, heavily sprayed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank so you for bringing that up because that's important. So, yeah. And I know we're going on tangents, but yes, yes, I know. Back, back to the facts. <laughs> yeah. So, in, but no, that's actually a really good point. That like most of the toxins that an animal eats mm -hmm. is stored in the fat cells. Exactly. So, so if you so get clean fats, right? And so, grass-fed butter, you know, has higher percentage of omega three, which is what we want. Right. So, yes. And CLA. Yeah. Exactly. MCT oil or coconut oil, as long as you know the source of where you're getting it from, it's extremely important. Okay. Tell us, do you mind telling us where that source, the ultimate, the ideal source would be? Yeah. I mean, I personally will use um, Brain Octane by Dave Asprey. Mm -hmm. That's the one that I, I recommend. You know, there's a lot of newer ones coming out on the market that I haven't been able to like verify mm -hmm. how it's being produced because you also... You know, in the production of these oils, you have to be careful because if they're overheated or if they're left out kind of in the tropics, they can get mold production. Yes. Rancid. So, you, you know, you have to make sure that the source of the oils that you're getting is, you know, a good source. And, and I think his is, from what I've seen, kind of the best one. And so let's just, for our audience, let's um, explain MCT is a medium chain triglyceride. So we've Correct. got those short chain fatty acids, which we're getting, well, actually a healthy body is going to produce as well as being able to consume. So our microbiome, our intestinal flora is going to produce beautiful short chain fatty acids for us. And the fish oil, you mentioned the, yeah. um, the omega South Asians, the omega-3s. Yeah. Omega so the fish oils, a good fish oil, eating fish, real food. Think of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So start off with real food. Like you can supplement. And I, and I, I think one of the things you have to be careful of with kind of the, the MCT oil and the coffee in the morning is it's also still very calorie dense. So right. if you're going to consume that, it has to be as an alternative to like your normal food for the day or for the, for that meal. I don't think you can go out and you know eat a whole bunch of fat, add this to it, and then think you're going to necessarily lose weight if that's what your goal is. You know, other fats that are, are saturated fats. I mean, you know, fats derived from from animals. So you know, lard, which people think about as you know something extremely dangerous, it's a great way to cook because it's it's very stable. Uh, mm -hmm. Ghee is another type of um, kind of churn butter that doesn't have some of the problems of butter, which is the casein component, which can be pro-inflammatory. Right, right. Uh, so there's a lot of those types of fat. The MCT oils are gaining popularity because your body doesn't actually store them as fat. Your body preferentially uses them and actually enhances the ability of the liver to basically break down your own fatty acids. And so there's a lot of research being done right now in regards to the MCT oils and more specifically C8, C10, which are subcomponents of MCT oil. And so hopefully if people are consuming these oils, and as you mentioned, they are calorie dense, ideally there's not a lot of room left or desire to continue eating. Right. And so hopefully the consumption of food or at least, you know, the carbohydrate component would be reduced. Yeah, and so it's kind of the opposite of what we've been taught as a society. So when they said take out the saturated fat, well, you can't really increase protein excessively. And so the only thing left to increase was the carbohydrate component. And so right. now we're basically doing the reverse. So we <laughs> maximize your fat because fat does not cause insulin to be increased in your system. So you don't get cascade of signals telling you that you're hungry. Another thing that people don't realize is that you know, fat cells produce or, or cause or basically allow you to become leptin resistant. And so you're never being told to turn off this hunger that you're constantly experiencing. Whoa. So we're, we're getting deep. Let me, yeah. Yeah, let me, let me, 
back in. We were talking <laughs> about uh, I, different types of fats. Sorry. So, yeah. so no, that's good. What do we got? Yeah, no, it's, it's great. So we're talking grass-fed butter, um, yep. gr- grass-fed ghee, which I'm a huge fan of because I, I actually have a small reaction to butter. I have it sometimes, but I know that I have an immune response to it. So ghee is my go-to. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about MCT oils and coconut oils and careful about the sources because we want to make sure that we're not getting mold and what else on there. Saturated fats in general and saturated animal fats like lard, fish and fish oil. What else do we have? Yeah, so then you know you get into more of the unsaturated fats. So olive oil would be the most common one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again with olive oil, you have to worry about um, your source. Um, olive oil tends to go mm, rancid a lot faster. Right. They have uh, also had. They'll also say something's olive oil, and it's actually mm-hmm. a blend of canola yes. oil and olive oil and yes or cottonseed yeah. <laughs> yeah or soy yes or, yes. or any any basically oil that's cheaper to produce right exactly. and it's funny you mentioned that because in order for olive oil to be labeled as you know extra virgin olive oil it only has to contain 18 percent olive oil oh wow. isn't that sad very so, sad so i mean you don't know you really don't know so that's why for me personally, I, I tend to avoid olive oil. And if I do get it, I know where I'm getting it from, that it has, you know, what it says it has. And I consume it pretty quickly because it goes rancid when it stays in the bottle as well. There's an extra, or a, there's an extra, pardon me, there's an excellent book by Tom Mueller called Extra Virginity. Yes. The, the sal- sublime and scandalous world of olive oil. And mm. it is astonishing how good food becomes adulterated all mm. for greed. All for yeah. greed. Follow the money. Yeah, exactly. Follow exactly. Money. So, um, I th- well, when my son was young, his two uh, favorite foods uh, were avocado cubes and olive slices those were my uh my toastios <laughs> i'd slice up olives and um, those little rings go a long way um, wow. yeah so uh, i mean there there's you're right we we have to shift our our mindset and go back to real food and uh start with our ch- well start with ourselves before we produce the next generation and then realize the impact the that we're going to have. That. Exactly. Oh, Dr. Lemansky, we could go on for quite some time. This yeah. is fascinating and an essential primer for, for people who are really looking at where to begin with, with changing their menu. Most of our listeners, of course, are dealing with a brain injury and need to know immediately what can we do so you're just saying take out those carbs and and start adding in some good good fats we'll underscore that word and that that can form the basis of a very nutritious lifestyle menu and recovery mm-hmm. absolutely and you know especially when we're talking about traumatic brain injuries which we haven't really talked too much about but everything that we're we're discussing right now especially the influence of nutrition on the mitochondria, it, it takes on an even more uh, important role when you're talking about brain and brain injury. Because um, we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, but the rapid increase and decrease in glucose levels and the effects on brain health is something that I don't think is talked about enough. And so you will actually see it in in like a hospital setting. A lot of elderly people who are diabetic and are in the hospital will have these wild fluctuations in their glucose, you know, 250 down to 30. Wow. And and that amount of fluctuation is extremely damaging for the brain. Now, if you're keto adapted, meaning that you have ketones, that doesn't have the same effect anymore. Because your brain is chronic or is consistently getting energy that it needs from the ketone. And when your mitochondria burn the ketones as energy, you actually 
get less reactive oxygen species, so it's a much cleaner fuel. Hmm. And so the, the consequence of that is you do not get all these tangles that we see in Alzheimer's. You do not get the vascular issues that we see in vascular dementia, all of which leads to the brain being healthier. And especially if you've already suffered a traumatic brain injury, it, it takes on a whole new level of importance. Right. Or want to optimize your brain function. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Levansky, you have put together a number of programs that can aid people in their transition from a, a sad diet to a ketogenic plan. And um, they can take, of course, what they've learned from this podcast because of your generosity of time and, and sharing your wisdom and your story. And if people want more, want some guidance, support, I'm going to direct them to John Lemansky, John L I M A N S K Y M D dot com. And you've got plans and pricing as a tab that uh, people can peruse and take a look at what they might like to do. And um, beyond the brain injury, we've got quite a mainstream following as well. So people are looking toward neurological health and how it impacts their lives, their children's lives. Um, really our society. Yeah, and I think it's important that you know change is going to happen at a grassroots level. It's going to be much more powerful for individuals to go to their primary care doctor and say, "Look, this is the research that I have on this way of eating. This is what's out there. There's the the benefit of the amount of information that's coming out is that we now have randomized controlled trials that illustrate the benefit of ketogenic lifestyle. And once we have enough of those, then we can really address the big medical communities and say, look, here's the research. Because that's what really influences medical decisions is, do we have the science to back it up? I can tell you anecdotally my experience, the experience I've had with patients. I can show you the numbers of how it's improved them metabolically. But until you really get a scientific study that shows this is what the real data shows, you're not going to have change on a societal level. Right. And I think the more people who are getting exposed to this through your podcast, through other informational systems, the more people are going to start questioning, look, you've been telling us for 60 years to eat this way. <laughs> this is the outcome. Well, now we're learning there's a better way. Here's the science. Let's make a change as a society and get healthier again. I'm so glad that uh, we've been able to connect, that um, we're able to disseminate this information and, and make some change. It just starts with one. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. So you. Thank you guys. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing what you got coming on um, in the future and we will definitely be in touch. Absolutely. Um, thanks guys. It was really a pleasure talking and um, let's be in touch soon. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Lemansky. All right, guys. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay. Hey. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's the episode. He's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> very, very well-informed and a pioneer because here we are rewriting nutritional history. Um, yeah. Going and back medical to medical history, right? Well, very much so. And uh, Dr. Lemansky has a very good point about how critical this is, just given the economic status. But look at what a brain injury does to a family. I mean, it, it, it really causes so much concern, time, energy, resources, and nutritional health for all of us. If we're all functioning at 110% or the best of our capacity, that's the truth, you know. And like with the clients I work with, I it's it's definitely affects the entire family in a big way. And so if we're all healthy and an injury occurs, then we're all better equipped to not only recover but to handle it. Yeah, take a look at JJ Virgin. Absolutely. Like that was that was pretty epic. Um, yes. what she was able to do. Yes. So if you would like to learn more about consultations, go to adventuresinbraininjury.com forward slash consult. And you have a fabulous interview series people can tap into. Yeah, that was, that was really cool. 
I got to interview some of my favorite people in brain and nutrition. And you've got little bite-sized pieces online still at feedabrain.com forward slash interview series. Check it out. Yes. And your book. Yeah. I published a book. <laughs> You're an author. Uh, I'm an author. A real <laughs> published author with a real physical book. Yeah, that's exciting. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, go to Amazon, pick that up if you haven't already. And, um, and leave me a review that really helps. Um, if you go to feedabrain.com forward slash review, it'll redirect you over to Amazon and auto scroll down to the exact place where you leave a review because I know it's like confusing to figure out like I've been trying to leave reviews for people I'm like where the hell do I go how do I do this <laughs> so that's yeah. a real easy way just go to feedabrand.com forward slash review fabulous and excellent a lot cool you make, you make it so easy yeah. well thanks again for another great episode my friend likewise yeah, Likewise. We'll Thank you guys for showing up and being here for it. We'll catch you next time. Adios. Bye. Someone take me to a doctor.